Today I'd like to talk about uh, app architecture. In particular, about uh, one very recent and very interesting architecture de uh, design pattern, which is called Viper. Uh, we tried this uh, pattern as software, and um, yeah, I'd like to tell about our experience with it and if it went okay or not really. So um, I'll start with a quick refresher about the state of things. As you probably know, um, Apple has been using MVC. This is their architecture of choice, their official architecture, although the MVC itself was invented in Microsoft, but it doesn't really matter. So yeah, is the architecture a lot of people use in their apps and probably something Apple uses as well. So um, yeah, since Apple gets to recommend things, they provide some guidelines about how to use this architecture, but um, these guidelines sound like view controllers should be autonomous. View controllers should not know about other view controllers' um, state or inner structure. Well, yeah, this is true, but it doesn't really tell us much. So, yeah, we can see that um, these recommendations are quite vague. They are open to interpretations. And, uh, yeah, as you probably experience yourself, there are countless interpretations of, of MVC by different people. So this, this is a problem. And this is a problem because people generally don't uh, understand where things should go. And uh, this means that if we have model and we have view, the only thing um, which we feel like can contain our logic is controller. So people just don't understand uh, where to put things, so they put everything in, in view controller. And as a result, we end up with massive view controller. I'm sure that everyone has heard about this. And this is pretty sad. And the reason this is sad is that massive view controllers are several thousand lines of code. It's not really a limit. They can, they can be really big. And they have many responsibilities. Networking, persistence, animations, user input handling, anything can be there. And um, as a consequence, they are hard to maintain because it's difficult to find your way around and understand what the flow of data is. They're also hard to understand. They are hard to test because you, it's difficult to isolate things you want to test. And they are hard to reuse because this is just one monolith and you cannot really do much with it without changing it. So, yeah. They are, they are absolutely messy and uh, they should generally be avoided. So, yeah. People, uh, this problem is quite old and people have been trying to find their way out of this problem. And um, they come up with uh, different solutions. One of the solutions is uh, MVVM, model view and uh, view model. The way it is different from view controller is that it uh, in it view controllers are uh, dumb. They don't, do not connect, contain any logic. They are just uh, renders, and the rest of the logic is in view model. But uh, what I've just said means that uh, you cannot really be sure what goes into view model. So. It often happens that view model ends up being the same pile of code as view controller. So it's not really a solution. And uh, of course, a lot of people have tried to come up with their approaches. And they have some strategies of dividing logic into components. And uh, some of these strategies are good, some are not so good. And um, yeah, but. Again, this is not really good because uh, if you have new people on your team, they need to learn your approaches. And uh, you might not be such a good uh, designer. You might not foresee all the use cases. So your abstraction may leak one day. So yeah, 
you ha we have to be careful. So, um, yeah, we should try to use um, approaches which are well defined, which are well discussed. And one of such approaches is uh, Viper. So, uh, what exactly is Viper? Um, Viper is a design pattern, as MVC and MVVM and many others. And uh, it is based on the ideas of uh, Robert Martin. It's the person behind uh, the Agile Manifesto, and he also wrote a lot of um, books on software architecture. So it's a pretty solid basis, I would say. So um, his ideas about clean architecture um, were processed by people at uh, Mutual Mobile, and they came up with, with Viper in 2013. So um, what, is, uh, what is Viper? Uh, Viper uh, is an architecture which tries to solve uh, the problem of massive view controller by splitting it uh, into um, components with, with well-defined responsibilities. And uh, these components are encoded in the acronym itself. These are view, interactor, presenter, entity, and router. So uh, let's look exactly how we can split massive view control into these components. So uh, let's consider an example. Let's say we have a to-do app, classic, I know. And this to-do app has three screens. It's a uh, task list, it's uh, task details, and add task screens. So we use, uh, task, we use task list. So this is the massive view controller which represents our task list screen. Uh, our first step would be to separate the routing, also known as navigation. This is pretty easy to do because uh, it's, it is done by calling uh, push view controller or present view controller, so we just find these uh, calls and this is our navigation. So um, this logic includes uh, creating and configuring other view controllers. So yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So we, so here we have router. Um, so as I mentioned before, its responsibility is to navigate to other view controllers. So here's how it can look. We can ask it to navigate to a task screen or to details of certain task. Yeah, so far so good, I guess. I, I hope it's, I hope it's clear. So uh, the next step. The next step is to separate the business logic. The business logic uh, is the logic which is responsible, which defines how data is stored, created, and changed. So uh, in our case, task list screen, we're talking about uh, fetching tasks, deleting them, updating when uh, the, our storage changes. So this is the logic we need to separate into another component. And this component is called Interactor. It stands for I in Viper. So yes, let's look at the, the contract of this component. So things, it can, things we can ask it to do. Uh, we can ask it to observe the task list, fetch it and delist, delete all tasks. I think it's pretty straightforward. And uh, you may have noticed that uh, none of the methods has return types. And um, this is not a coincidence. This is because uh, Viper wants to abstract this uh, detail of implementation. Uh, if we have return type, this means our implementation is synchronous. But it might as well be asynchronous. So we don't want to couple ourselves to this detail. So if we are communicating asynchronously, we need to receive results somehow. So we need the output protocol as well. Yes, so this is how Interactor looks. The next step is view. View contains everything that faces user. On one hand, uh, well, first, first task is to display things. 
And another task is to receive user input. This can be anything. This can be keyboard input. This can be touch input, things users do with our apps. So we are separating this logic into view. Yes, so as I said, view is supposed to display things. So this is what we see in its uh, input contract. So we can ask it to display, for example, navigation bar items or the task list. And um, it receives input events. So here are our input events. Our user can tap navigation bar button or, it can, or, 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 or they can select uh, one of the rows. And uh, I must mention one more thing. Um, we can say that lifecycle events are also input. So this is also something that view receives and passes on to other components. So we include that as well. So what do we have left? We already separated quite a few responsibilities. So our massive view controller is not really that massive anymore. So um, basically, we need two things, two things we have left. We need to take the user input from view and transform it so somehow into calls to rotor and interactor. So this is one thing our component will do one thing we have remaining. And another thing is taking the result from Interactor, applying some presentation logic, and then passing the result, the resulting view model to the view. So these two responsibilities. And we have a component called Presenter. Yeah, so now we are getting somewhere. We have more or less split our massive view controller. But uh, there are a couple more things to consider. Well, um, um, yeah, let's look at uh, how exactly Presenter does what it does. Let's uh, say we received navigation bar button tap. Uh, we see that uh, uh, we look at which button it is. If it's add button, we pass this request to rotor. If it's delete all, we ask our interactor to delete all tasks. So this is, this is how presenter responds to user input. And uh, yeah, another thing, um, we need to receive result from interactor, turn it into view model. I didn't, uh, I, I left out the, how it's done exactly, but uh, essentially this applies some sorting, some date formatting, for, for example, but it can be anything similar. Yes. And then we pass this uh, to our view. Okay, so we have E, which we haven't covered, of this acronym. And it's pretty straightforward, it's entity. And the uh, entity reflects uh, our domain. It's a piece of data in our domain. So in our case, this is our task. And uh, yeah, our task can contain identifier. Then it has uh, content which describes what it is. And then it has creation date. So pretty simple. Um, one thing we should consider is that uh, we have logic in Interactor, business logic. We are fetching tasks, for example. But the problem is that we might need to fetch tasks to, do the, to perform the same logic in some other place. So it makes sense not to keep it directly in Interactor, but rather to move it into service. So, yeah. Uh, we have services which actually do the job of fetching tasks. And the services are called by our interactor, which technically still handles business logic, but now it doesn't do it directly. It orchestrates the services. So we can reuse services in other modules, and this, this makes it better. So let's look at service. So one service deals with one type of entity, and 
this is the service which deals with tasks. It can, it can fetch all tasks or one task by ID. It can create task, the list task, and it can observe tasks. So this is the service. Also, another thing, as you see, we have a lot of components now, and um, somebody needs to create them. And of course, somebody needs to do all the connections. You see that we have quite a few connections here. And uh, assembly is actually the component which is responsible for that. So it uh, instantiates all the components of a module. It wires them up together. And then it also adds any external dependencies we might have. So this is the responsibility of assembly. Now that we know what the components of Viper module are, let, let's look at how they work together. Let's consider the case where our view has just loaded. So it starts in view. View has received a lifecycle event, view did load. It tells about this uh, to presenter. Presenter, in response to this event, um, asks Interactor to fetch the tasks. Interactor, by using service, actually does the job of fetching the tasks. And then it notifies the presenter that it completed the task, that it fetched all the tasks. Then a uh, presenter does the, applies the presentation logic, um, creates view model from the task list, and uh, asks view to render this view model. And as a result, we have the list of tasks on screen. Yeah. So, so far so good. Everything seems great and uh, easy to understand, at least to me. But um, you might argue that this use case is fairly simple and even trivial. And I can say that, yes, this is the case. It really is simple and, yeah. In reality, things are a bit more complex. You may have noticed, if you read the articles about architecture regularly, that people often choose um, to do applications as their example. And um, there's a reason behind this, I think. These applications are pretty simple, and you don't really need to put a lot of work into your example. And, um, well, the risk is low that um, you will run into some edge cases which you have not foreseen. And uh, again, the risk is low that people will start asking you inconvenient questions. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Well, it's difficult with such simple examples. Yeah, but as I said, in real world, things are a bit more complicated. You have your abstractions, but uh, you cannot be sure that they will stand up to the test. What are you going to do if, if your abstractions are going to leak? And you never know until you try. And this is what we did in one of our projects at Softwork. We decided to try Viper architecture because it looked promising. Because we read a lot of posts where people were really excited about it. So yeah, we decided why not. Uh, yeah, there's one thing I would like to mention. Um, as you, as you, as you saw, Viper has uh, structure. It has a lot of rules which govern the structure. And the problem is that the more structure you have, the more rules you have, the easier it is to break these rules if you don't know what you are doing. So, yeah, it kind of it, it kind of means for us that uh, we did the same. We had to, to try and fail. And uh, now I'd like to tell about problems we had. Well, uh, the first problem we had is module generation. As you probably saw, 
there are a lot of components and uh, there are a lot of uh, connections between the, these components. So if we do the counting, um, we need view, interactor, presenter, assembly, and rotor. That's five components. We also need five protocols, uh, input-output for view, input-output for interactor, uh, and uh, router input. That's already 10. Now, if you want to test, you need to create tests for each of your components. Now, let's, um, let's say for a moment that you are using Objective-C. That's even more files, because you have to create header and the implementation file itself. So, as you understand, that's, um, that's a lot of work. And uh, we started by doing these things manually, but it turns out that uh, this, that's, that's, uh, that's a lot of work. Uh, in the beginning, it, it would take us two or three hours just to set up the bare-bone module. Of course, we weren't that familiar with the architecture itself, but still, that's a lot of time just to write all this boilerplate. So, yeah, it's, it's three wasted hours, you, you, because uh, you don't write any business logic, you don't create any value. It's just, it's just wasted. So we quickly felt the need to automate module creation. And uh, we were lucky that there were people who did this before. And uh, there are many tools which do this, actually. But uh, I'd like to tell you about one tool we really liked. It's called uh, Generamba, and it was created by people at Rambler. It's, uh, it's a company in Russia. So, um, yeah, this tool is written in Ruby. It uses uh, liquid templates. It integrates with Xcode project. So it knows where to put your files. If you point it to, the, to your test target or to your main target, so it knows where to put files. And uh, yeah, th there are some existing templates. You can easily modify and create your own templates. So now creating module is as simple as running this one command. Generamba gen module name and template name. So yeah, I can say that this, mod this problem is uh, pretty much solved. Good, moving on to the next one. Dependency ejection. Again, a lot of components, um, dependencies between components of the module. And let's not forget that we are depending on some services which, may, which might ha have their own dependencies. So, yeah, a lot of people felt the need to use dependency injection frameworks. And we looked into this as well. And um, at the point uh, when we were starting our project, there were no dependency injection frameworks specifically for Swift. Of course, we could use Typhoon, but uh, the problem with that framework is that it comes from Objective-C and it forces you to use Objective-C classes. And this means that uh, we cannot use a lot of Swift features like structs, for example. And it was a deal breaker for us, so we decided against us. Besides, if we compare these two snippets, so this is how the module setup looks with uh, one of the dependency frameworks. It's another dependency framework I tried later, which is written specifically for Swift, it, which doesn't have many problems Typhoon does. But still, you can see that there's a lot of code to write. And if you compare this to the snippet to the right, which is manual and which can be easily automated. We can include it in our Generamba templates. So, yeah, we decided that it's not worth it learning another framework and increasing complexity because it is quite complex as it is. So we decided to go with, uh, with manual injection. So, um, of this code, only this line that is uh, injecting the task store is written manually. The module wiring is automated, so it's, it's not a problem. 
Yes, so this is with uh, this is what we have with dependency injection. Another problem which we did not directly encounter, but which is definitely something to keep in mind if you have a big app, is that if you have a lot of classes, this may slow down your app startup. As uh, Apple engineers mentioned and at one of the WWDC sessions last year, um, if you have around, uh, if, you, if you have 10 or 20,000 classes, this slows down your application by seven to 800 milliseconds, which is, which is significantly. So um, um, Viper definitely doesn't help with this problem because it just forces you to have these five components in every module. So yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. The next important thing we had to figure out was memory management. So probably everyone knows that uh, both Swift and Objective-C use automatic reference counting. And um, it's pretty good. Most of the time you don't need to think about memory management yourself. But there's one problem which it has, and I'm sure that all of you know what this problem is. And this is retain cycles. This is when two objects have strong references to each other, so they cannot be deallocated. And with them, all the objects which are touched with strong links. So um, you see that we have um, a lot of potential for these uh, cycles here. You see that view needs to know about presenter. It needs to supply input events. And presenter needs to ask view to render. Presenter needs to send requests to interactor. Interactor needs to return to results. And also uh, this relation. Rotor does navigation, but as it is in UI kit, you do navigation by pushing, presenting, or adding view controller as a child view controller. So you need to, to have reference to view controller. So yeah, as I said, quite a, quite a lot of potential for retain cycles. But uh, as we figured out, it is possible to set, to, to use uh, strong and weak references in a way which lets you forget about um, manual memory management, which pretty much solved this problem. So, yeah, the idea is to make view the center of things. Because in general, we never know uh, when system is going to release the view. So, yeah, we, we uh, introduced the rule that as soon as view is released, everything else is supposed to be released. So, um, the way to do this is to make view own the presenter. So this is a bit tricky because uh, logically presenter is the center of things. It coordinates uh, other components, but with memory management it is easier when view owns presenter, then presenter in its turn owns router and interactor, and interactor owns, owns uh, services. So this means that as soon as system releases the view, we have no for example, we, I don't know, we popped the view controller, we dismissed it, or something else happened. So as soon as um, view deallocates, we have no strong, uh, we, we have no retained cycles, so everything just uh, deallocates normally. And um, it's easy to automate this setup, so we don't need to think about which link has to be strong, which has to be weak, so I would say that uh, this problem is solved as well. Yeah. Um, I, now I'd like to move on to the next problem. And this problem is that, as I said before, um, UIKit was designed with MVC in mind. So um, this means that some components might not play nicely with Viper. 
I, um, if we look at one of the examples, it's an S fetch results controller. It takes uh, fetch uh, request as an input, and then it uh, sends you notifications when the results of this request change. So yeah, since seems uh, pretty easy to use. It's uh, really convenient to use with MVC. You get notifications. You can quickly update your view in state, like uh, animate some cells. I know, update your UI. Everything's great. But if we try to use it with Viper, it's not really that straightforward. We cannot put it in view controller because we said before that view controller, which is our view, uh, is supposed to just render and receive input events. So, no, it doesn't really fit there because, well, it's a persistent logic. It doesn't belong there. We cannot really put it in presenter. And uh, the reason for that is that um, Fetch Results Controller is a data source. And we have already another data source, which is Interactor. So having two data sources is also not the way to go. And besides that, we don't really want our presenter to know that we are using core data. It, it doesn't need to care about such things. It, it needs to be able to work with, say, real or any other persistence mechanism we choose. So, no, we cannot put it in presenter. So, um, the only other thing which makes sense is interactor. It already hands uh, data, persistence. It knows about core data, so no problems here. But, um, well, it's not perfect either. Because uh, if we, for example, need some state, and state is generally stored in presenter, then we need, to, we need these two components to communicate before we can actually decide what we are going to display. And besides that, uh, since we don't want our presenter to know about core data, we need to transform core data objects into something we can use in presenter. And there's also a change type, which is coupled to core data. It's an enum which tells you whether it's insert, delete, and so on. So this can also, uh, also cannot be in presenter. So you can see that uh, this communication can become quite awkward. So we actually went the way of uh, transforming all these uh, core data concepts into something presenter can work with. And I cannot say this is a it's a beautiful piece of code. So we made it work, but um, well, we cannot say that this problem is solved. Now I'd like to talk about refactoring and code navigation. As you know, Xcode still doesn't have Swift code refactoring. And uh, app code is a bit better. It's actually quite good, but it's still not perfect. Some refactorings don't work all the way. So, well, still some room for improvement here. So uh, what this means is if you want to change your method name, you have to do it by hand. And you have to do it in two places, because you have uh, the protocol and you have the implementation. For example, you have Interactor input and you have Interactor itself. So you have to change the name manually in both places. And same goes for method parameters. Well, with method parameters, you can uh, make life easier for yourself if you put them in some kind of uh, data structure. And that, that, uh, that means that you only need to change this data structure if you need to pass some additional things to this method. And this certainly makes life easier, but it's more like workaround. There really should be refactoring for that. And um, similar problem we have with code navigation. If we try to go to definition of method or property, both Xcode and AppCode take us to, to the protocol. 
and from and from there Xcode cannot take you to the actual implementation. AppCode can, but still it's one extra step, so it's not really that convenient. Yes. So, uh, yeah, similar problem we have with uh, find usages. Xcode uh, has some rudimentary form of find usages in Assistant Editor, but I ended up not using it after all. AppCode actually has uh, find usages, so it's slightly, it, it helps you a bit with this. Another problem, as, as you remember, uh, in my example with Interactor, uh, the communication between presenter and interactor is asynchronous. So you, so this uh, means that uh, you send request to Interactor in one place, and then you handle the result in a completely different place. So this is how it looks in practice. Here's our request to Interactor, and then somewhere in a different place we handle the result. Well, there aren't other methods here at the moment, but um, I can tell you when presenter grows, it becomes really difficult to find your way around, to find the method which is supposed to respond to this request. So, yeah, this problem uh, might be solved with abstractions which encapsulate asynchronous code execution, like promises. But um, we haven't really used the, these extensively for these purposes, so I still feel like it requires some additional thinking. But, yeah, this might be one of the solutions to this problem. Yes, and of course, last but not the least, Viper is not easy to understand. There are a lot of rules, and uh, developer needs to know where each things, each of the things go. And um, it's not really easy. You have to figure out things yourself because there aren't any real uh, learning so sources on the internet which can help you with that. There are these countless uh, Hello World examples, but they help up to, sub, up to some point. A lot of things need to be... We, we, we had to figure out a lot of things ourselves. So, yeah, it's trial and error. And uh, time is something to consider. Uh, when we started with Viper, it took us two weeks. Yes, I think it was two weeks. It took us two weeks just to understand how it works, where things go, and to actually become um, productive in it. Like to... By productive, I mean that uh, we didn't have to spend time thinking about architecture. We just knew how to do it. And uh, getting to this point took us around one month. So uh, what this means is, if you often have new people on the team, you need to keep in mind that it will, if they have no prior experience with Viper, it will take them that much time to learn it and to, to get used to it. So yeah, this is definitely something to keep in mind. And what's the bottom line for Viper? Well, as you see, Viper has plenty of problems. Some of these are inherent, to, are inherent to the architecture itself, and others are just caused by lack of uh, mature development tools. But uh, the bottom line is that Viper is not a silver bullet. You need to consider it carefully. And uh, since there's a lot of overhead, I can say that it's definitely an overkill for small projects. You don't need to create all these structures if you have an app which is just five screens or something. There, isn't, there, there just isn't this potential for your view controllers to become massive because you just don't have that much logic in the first place. Yeah, so I would definitely not advise using Viper in small projects. Also, since refactoring is really costly, it's really expensive and difficult, 
I would say that you need to make sure that requirements are stable. Because if you need to change something, well, there's going to be refactoring. But uh, to finish on a bright note, I can definitely say that I'm glad that I tried Viper because it really pushed me a bit further. It made me think more carefully about architecture. And I feel like this means that if I get back to using, using MVC, I think it, there's slightly less chance that I'll do something terrible. Yeah, so this is it. Thanks for listening.